course is on the new hazard communication standard. The objectives today are we're going to learn how to understand the new standard as it applies to dentistry, learn about the new label elements, and learn how to manage safety data sheets, formerly called material safety data sheets. There's a lot of chemicals that we come in contact with in our dental practice. Today, there are fewer and fewer hazardous chemicals, but there are still some. So OSHA requires us to have a system of hazard communication that's in writing and is explained to employees. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration requires employers to provide a safe work environment for employees. New chemicals are being developed faster than their safety can be evaluated. The OSHA hazard communication standard is now aligned with the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. This update to the hazard communication standard will provide a common, coherent approach to classifying chemicals and communicating hazard information on labels and safety data sheets. The revised standard will improve the quality and consistency of hazard information in the workplace, making it safer for workers by providing easily understandable information on appropriate handling and safe use of hazardous chemicals. The update will also help reduce trade barriers that result in productivity improvements for American businesses that regularly handle, store, and use hazardous chemicals while providing cost savings for American businesses that periodically update their safety data sheets and labels for chemicals. So the new hazard communication standard better protects workers and conforms with the globally harmonized system. Everyone working around hazardous chemicals and toxic substances has a right to know about the possible dangers and how to protect themselves. The main purpose of the hazard communication standard is to make sure workers understand potential risk of working with hazardous chemicals and toxic substances, what to do if exposed, and how to respond. In the past, there were no set rules about what product label or material safety data sheets should look like. Now, under the new standard, labels and safety data sheets will all be the same regardless of who produces them or where they're produced. The new labels alert people to potential hazards and provide important details on how to handle chemicals safely. The language must be clear and easy to understand, and the pictograms or images are now standardized. The new system spells out potential hazards and protection in terms that everyone worldwide can understand. In this new system, every hazardous chemical and substance not only carries a uniform label with information that's easier to understand, but also provides warnings that are clearer, necessary actions more obvious, and protections readily apparent. The hazard communication standard is now called the employee's right to know law. And it updates labels, safety data sheets, and hazard classifications. Well, dental workers are exposed to chemicals every day, including disinfectants, sterilants, cleaning agents, soaps, medicaments, latex proteins, etchants, injectable pharmaceuticals, and compressed gases. There are human health hazards and risks of becoming ill or sensitized from exposure to chemicals. There are also physical hazards like fire or explosion. Irritant chemical dermatitis is a non-allergic condition. One of the health hazards dental workers can experience is skin irritation. Frequent and repeated use of hand hygiene products, particularly soaps and other detergents, are a primary cause of chronic irritant contact dermatitis among healthcare workers. Discomfort due to irritation can interfere with adherence to recommended hand hygiene practices. Consequently, it's important to have different types of hand hygiene products and gloves available in a dental office. This dental assistant has allergies that developed as a result of exposure to glutaraldehyde. She used neomycin to treat the allergy or the allergic condition, and she developed a secondary contact 
allergy to the topical product that she used, the antibiotic that she used to treat the work-related dermatologist. This assistant with hand dermatitis was allergic to glutaraldehyde that she used to sterilize instruments. The hands of this hospital maintenance worker are depigmented from contact with a phenolic germicidal detergent. Irritation to the chemical is not a prerequisite for the pigment loss to occur. The loss of pigment may be permanent. Some of the disinfectants used in dentistry contain phenolics. Hypersensitivity is the result of exposure to natural rubber latex proteins in latex gloves. Latex gloves have proved effective in preventing transmission of many infectious diseases to healthcare workers, but for some workers, exposure to latex may result in an allergic reaction. Reports of such reactions have increased in recent years, and it's estimated that between 8 to 12 percent of healthcare workers are latex sensitive. Latex allergy is a reaction to certain proteins in latex rubber, and the amount of latex exposure needed to produce sensitization or an allergic reaction is unknown. Increasing the exposure to latex protein increases the risk of developing allergic symptoms in the sensitized person. Symptoms usually begin within minutes of exposure, but they can occur hours later and can be quite varied. Mild reaction to latex involves skin redness, rash, hives, or itching. More severe reactions may include respiratory symptoms such as runny nose, sneezing, itchy eyes, scratchy throat, and asthma or difficulty breathing, coughing spells, and wheezing. Latex proteins become fastened to the lubricant powder used in some gloves, and when workers change gloves, the protein powder particles become airborne and can become inhaled. Type 1, immediate allergic reaction, is a response that's considered a true immunoglobulin E histamine-mediated allergy to allergenic glove proteins. Type 1 allergic response is potentially the most serious type of reaction. This reaction can involve local or systemic symptoms. Localized reactions occur at the site of exposure. For example, hives appearing at the area of contact, allergic rhino conjunctivitis, and asthma following exposure to airborne allergens are also localized reactions. Generalized reactions are those occurring at sites in the body distant from the site of exposure. For example, asthma after a skin exposure or hives at a site other than where the exposure occurred. Type 1 allergic response is the most difficult to manage and potentially life-threatening. The presence of allergic manifestations to allergenic natural rubber latex proteins in indicates an increased risk for anaphylaxis, a rare but severe reaction experienced by some individuals who developed an allergy to certain allergenic proteins. Type 1 reaction can occur within seconds to minutes of exposure to the allergen. In the case of natural rubber latex, the allergen natural rubber latex proteins either is transferred by touching a product with the allergen, uh, for example with a glove, or by inhaling the allergen. Powder to which natural rubber latex protein gloves is absorbed. Incidentally, the Food and Drug Administration recently placed a ban on powdered exam gloves, so we can no longer purchase them or use them. When such a reaction begins in a highly sensitive individual, it can progress rapidly from swelling of the lips and airways to shortness of breath and may progress to shock and death. Dental health care workers should immediately report any conditions such as irritation, allergic reaction, or other symptoms that may develop as a result of exposure to products or chemicals at work. You know, it's not just at work that we're exposed to chemicals. You've got hazardous chemicals at home, in your garage, for example, automotive fluids or perhaps gardening supplies. Also, in your kitchen, maybe oven cleaners or other chemicals that you use to clean household products with. To avoid costly OSHA citations, 
Employers are required to provide training on the new hazard communication standard. The risk of an OSHA inspection is nothing compared to the risk of an employee who becomes sick or injured as a result of working with a chemical and not fully understanding how to use that chemical or how to protect themselves. Training also creates a culture of safety, which is important as it increases our confidence at work and reduces errors. Review your written exposure control plan with employees and make certain everyone understands in a dental office exactly how we're exposed to chemicals. We can be exposed by skin absorption, by inhalation of chemicals, or by ingestion of chemicals. When a chemical agent is used, usually the person using the product is using exam gloves. And the question is, could that chemical wick into the exam glove and get on the skin of the individual? Another way that we don't often think of for chemical exposure is by injection. If you have a needle stick or incident where you're exposed to anesthetic, that's considered to be a hazardous chemical. So we need to make sure that we recap our needles and uh, sharps devices safely. Anesthetic needles, my preference is to use a one-handed scoop technique or a needle recapping device. And when I use a one-handed scoop technique, I always use a true one-handed scoop technique. In other words, I scoop up the cap of the syringe, lean the cap toward the counter or treatment tray, push down, as opposed to scoop up the cap, tip my syringe needle with the cap toward the ceiling and reach around with my other hand to secure it. In the slide, you'll see that process of scooping up the cap of the needle and then tilting the syringe down instead of up. It's a true one-handed scoop technique. In your written hazard communication plan, you'll also review material safety data sheets. Now, material safety data sheets have been given a new name. The word material has been dropped. Now they're simply called safety data sheets or SDS sheets instead of MSDSs. These new SDS sheets have a 16 section format. The new 16 section format shows information such as properties of each chemical, the physical and uh, health, as well as environmental hazards, protective measures and safety precautions for handling, storing, and transporting the chemical. The information contained in the safety data sheet must be in English, although it may be in other languages if desired. Section one through eight contains general information about the chemical, the identification, the hazards, composition, safe handling practices, and emergency control procedures like firefighting. This information should be helpful to those who need to get the information quickly. Section nine to 11 and 16 contain other technical and scientific information, such as physical and chemical properties, stability and reactivity information, toxicological information, exposure control information, and other information, including the date of preparation or last revision. The safety data sheet must also contain section 12 through 15 to be consistent with the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. But OSHA will not enforce the content of these sections because they concern matters handled by other agencies. You might wonder why we need to have these safety data sheets. Well, first of all, it provides information to employees about the hazardous chemicals that they're working with, including what health risks they may encounter. Spill cleanup information. What do I do if I spill it? What do I do if I get it on me? What do I do if I get it in me? Uh, disposal information. How do I containerize this product? Does it need to be picked up directly from my practice or is it something that I can put into the trash can? The safety data sheets are also part of our hazardous chemical inventory. Now, 
OSHA manuals describe creating an inventory of hazardous chemicals. It doesn't mean how many bottles of one particular chemical do you have and in what location of your practice. What it means is that how many different chemicals do you have in your office and where is the information on them. So a hazardous chemical inventory can simply be the MSDS book that you've already likely compiled. Now remember, they're not called material safety data sheets anymore, they're called safety data sheets. So as we start to collect these safety data sheets for new products as they're delivered, we can place them in our MSDS book. You can also store information about chemicals and safety data sheets in your computer if you'd like to scan the pages into your computer. There are online programs where you can go to a website to get the information on the chemicals that you're working with. Uh, in other words, it's an online safety data sheet program. My favorite is simply to have a three ring binder where I collect the safety data sheets, three ring hole punch them, highlight the name of the product, and file it in alphabetical order. So the steps for creating your Hazard communication program include training, include understanding the label requirements, and collecting safety data sheets. You can assemble your safety data sheet book very easily as new products come into the office. Again, I recommend a three ring binder, and I recommend that you file your hazardous chemicals in alphabetical order by the name of the product. People ask me all the time, how long do I need to keep the safety data sheet? Well, if your state doesn't have its own regulation, the federal regulation is that the safety data sheet becomes part of the employee's medical record for those who experience illness or injury as a result of exposure to that hazardous chemical. And medical record keeping forms are required to be maintained duration of employment plus 30 years. So my suggestion in managing your safety data sheet three ring binder is weed out the SDSs or MSDSs of products you no longer use, but don't throw them away. Create a file folder or a banker's box and call it MSDSs or SDSs of products we no longer use and keep it indefinitely. It shows that you had the MSDS or safety data sheet that was available at the time that the employee worked for you and that you made that information available to them. Not all products need an MSDS. For example, household products that we use in a household manner in a dental office, window cleaner, um, dish soap, air freshener, cleaning products. So you don't need to accumulate safety data sheets for those products unless you use them differently. Sometimes we do use household products differently in a dental practice. Perhaps we use sodium hypochlorite, commonly known as bleach, as a disinfectant. Uh, we might use uh, rubbing alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. And so if we use things in our dental office differently or in a greater quantity than we would typically in a household setting, we should have the safety data sheet on file. Let's take, for example, window cleaner. If you use window cleaner the same way you would use it at home, perhaps you clean the bathroom mirrors or maybe the front door of your practice with the window cleaner, and you're only using it for a few minutes at a time, you wouldn't need a safety data sheet. But let's say that you hire me to work in your office and low man on the totem pole has to clean all the windows in the practice every Wednesday afternoon. It takes three hours to clean all the windows inside and out in your practice. Well, I'm exposed to three hours of window cleaner, which means I could be exposed to higher levels for a longer period of time of formaldehyde, isopropanol, and ammonia. And this can cause serious illness or death if ingested. It can also cause uh, irritation or burns to my lungs. We also need to be careful with the combination of chemicals. Sometimes we mix chemicals together inadvertently that can be deadly. 
For example, bleach and ammonia products can release a deadly chlorine gas if they're mixed together. The other thing training needs to include is the new label elements. So let's take a look at what those label elements are. We have first a picnogram, a signal word, a hazard statement, and a precautionary statement. This shows the nine different pictograms. They're all required to be a diamond shape and they must have a red border. Plus the pictogram must be black. It must be exactly these pictograms and they must be on a white background. The label must also have the product identifier. This is the pictogram for health hazard. If you see this bad boy on a container of a product you're about to use, pay close attention. It could be carcinogenic. It could cause mutagenicity, reproductive toxicity. It could be a respiratory sensitizer or cause target organ toxicity, aspiration toxicity. This next pictogram is called flame, and it simply means that the product you're about to work with is flammable. There's a case study of a nurse who used alcohol hand sanitizer. Immediately after applying the hand sanitizer, she removed her isolation gown as she touched the doorknob to leave the treatment room. She heard an audible spark and a flame ignited in her hand. So be very careful with anything that's flammable. This is another bad boy to find on a container. This is explanation mark. And this particular pictogram tells us that the product we're about to work with is an irritant to our skin or eyes, a skin sensitizer. It could cause acute toxicity, narcotic effect, respiratory tract irritant, or it's hazardous to the ozone, which is not an OSHA required uh, item. The next pictogram is gas cylinder, which conveys gases under pressure. Make certain that you recognize that you have gases under pressure. Oxygen, for example, is in every dental office. Some dental offices use nitrous oxide, and these compressed gas cylinders need to be labeled and secure from falling over. Now, oxygen and nitrous tanks aren't the only compressed gas we may have in a dental office. Sometimes we have helium tanks where we provide uh, balloons for kids. Uh, we have containers of compressed gas. For example, at the front desk, you might have uh, the um, canned air or canned uh, spray that you use for dusting off your computer keyboard. One dental receptionist from San Francisco shared with me how she was injured by a can of canned air. She used it mostly for cleaning her keyboard and around her desk and in areas where dust accumulated around her computer. One day she was shredding documents and her paper shredder became jammed. The little uh, cutting edges were hot, so she used her canned air to blow the pieces of paper out of the paper cutter. When the stream of air hit the hot blades, it ignited and the flame followed the stream of air all the way into her hand. The can of canned air exploded, causing third degree burns, threw her against the wall, burned her hair and her eyebrows. Don't underestimate what products we're using, even if they're household in nature, they could cause serious physical harm as they did to this receptionist. This next pictogram is called corrosion. And when you see this pictogram on a container, be sure you are reading the directions for use carefully. It could cause skin corrosion or burns, irreversible eye damage. It could be corrosive to metals. We want to make certain that we are using this product wearing the proper personal protective equipment. This next pictogram is exploding bomb. And I can't think of anything we use in dentistry that explodes, but it is part of the uh, hazard communication labeling system. So if we do start using products that explode, you'll find this pictogram. This next pictogram is called flame over circle, and it stands for oxidizer. There may be products that we use in a dental laboratory that are considered to be oxidizers. 
This is the pictogram called environment, and it is not an OSHA requirement. It conveys that the product you're about to use has uh, aquatic toxicity, and it could be harmful to the environment. The pictogram conveys a fish that is supposed to be a dead fish, and while it looks like a dead tree, this is actually considered to be dead coral, like coral reef. So when we see a product that has this environmental pictogram on it, it conveys aquatic toxicity. And who doesn't recognize the final pictogram? It's called skull and crossbones, and it conveys acute toxicity, either fatal or toxic. Sometimes we'll see multiple pictograms on a container. So there may be multiple hazards present with the product you're about to use. Be sure you read the directions and follow all the manufacturer's recommendations for personal protective equipment to protect yourself. In this picture, notice the slight difference in the skull of crossbones and the corrosion images. These are old and do not conform to the new standard. The skull and crossbones on this slide show teeth and no mandible whereas the correct skull and crossbones actually has no teeth and a mandible. When it comes to secondary containers, not the manufacturer's original container, but let's say that you take a product out of its original container and you place it in a secondary container. You have to place two pieces of information on that secondary container. First, the name of the hazardous product, and secondly, the hazard warning statement. Now the hazard statement is like my favorite statement and I'll tell you why. When we transfer a product from an original container to a secondary container, we need to label that secondary container. And it must have the name of the hazardous substance, that's easy, you can simply look at the container and transfer the name. And it needs to have the hazard warning statement. It used to be hard to find the hazard warning statement. You'd either have to pour through the information on the original container or scan through the MSDS sheet. Now the hazard statement is required to be present and visible on the label of the original container. There are two types of hazard statements. Physical hazard, for example, something might be a highly flammable liquid and vapor and then a health hazard. For example, a product might have uh, toxicity, could cause liver or kidney damage. So the two pieces of information that we need to transfer are the name of the hazardous product and the hazard warning statement. There's another part of the label called the signal word. The signal word, there's actually just two of them. The two signal words are danger and warning. These indicate the relative severity of the hazard and alert the reader to potential hazards by simply looking at the label. The signal word danger is used for more severe hazards while warning is used for less severe hazards. Another label element is the precautionary statement. It's a phrase that describes recommended measures to be taken to minimize or uh, revert adverse effects resulting from exposure to a hazardous chemical or improper storage or handling of a hazardous chemical. Examples are keep container tightly closed, store in a cool, well-ventilated area, do not breathe vapors, or wear protective gloves. The precautionary statement will also have information such as firefighting measures. On the screen, we now show a sample label. The manufacturer is responsible for this information. You don't have to fill this information out. It will already be provided for you. So the first part of the label shows product identifier, what's in the container. The next part is the manufacturer's name and the address, as well as an emergency contact phone number. Just below that are the precautionary statements. For example, what personal protective equipment to wear and other precautionary items like store in a cool, well-ventilated area, firefighting measures and first aid measures. On the second column, you'll see the hazard pictograms. Now earlier, we went through the hazard pictograms. 
I'd like you to see if you can remember what the two pictograms stood for. What is the first pictogram? Write it down. And now look at the second pictogram. Write that down. If you said health hazard for the first pictogram, you'd be right. And if you said flame for the second pictogram, you'd be right. Just below the pictograms is the signal word. It shows the signal word danger. Do you remember what the other signal word was? Write it down. If you wrote down warning, you would be correct. The way that I remember the signal words, danger is more severe and warning is less severe. If I'm driving along the highway and I get pulled over by local law enforcement and I get a warning, that's less severe than if I get a ticket. If I get a ticket, that's certainly danger. Underneath the signal word is the hazard statement. And remember, that's my favorite part of the label because that's the part of the label that I need to transfer to a secondary container if I'm going to take the product out of its original container and put it in a secondary container. For example, maybe I'm working with a disinfectant that I purchased in a spray container. But the spray container breaks down. I still have product left. I might go to the market and buy a plant sprayer, just a plain old sprayer container. I need to label it with the name of the hazardous product and the hazard warning statement. Below that, you'll see supplemental information. Again, that's the manufacturer's responsibility. They might put a lot number or they might have an expiration date or other important information. As part of your hazard communication training, be sure and remind everyone to read and follow the manufacturer's directions for use. Sometimes manufacturers will change some part of the instructions, whether it's what personal protective equipment to use, to how long to, let's say, leave a surface disinfectant on a surface. Make sure that all the required personal protective equipment recommended by the manufacturer is available for employees to use. When working with chemicals that require heavy duty utility gloves, be sure that utility gloves are available for employees. Use common sense when you're working with chemicals. For example, do you ever reach above eye level to get a product off of a shelf? What if that chemical was a hazardous liquid chemical or a powder chemical and the container was not fully closed. Perhaps the last person that used it didn't screw the top on tightly. If it tips over, that could fall into your eyes. So I always recommend storing liquid or powder chemicals at eye level or below and maybe even put them in a basket or something to help keep them from falling over. Make certain that you have an eye wash station that's accessible and working, that's cold water only, where a sign designates its location. We want to make certain that we run the eye wash station periodically, weekly at least, to make sure that the flow is still going and that it hasn't been uh, gummed up with uh, deposits that sometimes can accumulate in tap water. Review your written plan with employees so everyone knows what they are responsible for when it comes to working with hazardous chemicals. Explain the meaning of the signs, the labels, and the symbols. Some labels convey biohazards. Some convey radiation hazards. Some convey chemical hazards. Accidental exposure to chemicals can occur, and so employees should be given a list of steps and action plan for what they should do in the event of exposure. In most cases, the MSDS will tell you if you have a chemical, let's say that you breathe in and it's irritating your lungs, go outside and breathe fresh air. If you splashed a chemical in your eyes, go to the eye wash station and flush your eyes. The industrial guideline for eyewash flushing is 15 minutes. Or if you've gotten chemicals on your skin, you can wash it off with soap and water. Make certain that everyone knows where the eyewash station is, how to use it, and of course where the first aid kit is. In addition to providing first aid, access to a healthcare provider must be made available. 
So who is your healthcare provider? Do employees know where exactly to go if they need medical attention beyond simple first aid? Medical evaluation must be made available for employees and the routine steps are provide first aid, go for medical evaluation, but take with you the safety data sheet so that the medical evaluator knows what chemical you've been exposed to and be sure and document those events on the employee's medical record keeping form. Medical record keeping forms can be found in your OSHA manual. Be sure everyone is aware of your fire and emergency plan. This should be in writing and there should be a map in various locations of the office showing the exits, the location of fire extinguishers, fire alarms, and eyewash stations. Fire prevention and evacuation plans should be discussed well in advance of an emergency. And instruction on how to use a fire extinguisher should be provided to employees. You can simply get the fire extinguisher and read the directions on the label and have a practice session. If you have an expired fire extinguisher, you might use that and really have a practice session maybe out in the parking lot of how to use a fire extinguisher. Emergency exit signs should be located above all exit doors. Incidentally, when was the last time you had a fire drill? Do employees know exactly what to do in the event of a fire? Sometimes going for the fire extinguisher is the wrong thing to do. If a flame has fully engulfed part of a wall, firefighting isn't provided as part of OSHA training to employees, so they need to evacuate the building promptly. Your written hazard communication plan is required. Make certain that you review this with your team that is up to date and personalized in your OSHA manual. Team training includes how to access the safety data sheets, how to read a safety data sheet, how to understand the label requirements, and how to prepare yourself using personal protective equipment for working with hazardous chemicals. Remember, to increase confidence and reduce errors and to expedite the action plan in the event that there is an exposure to chemicals, prevention is key. Conduct the training in advance of an emergency so each and every team member knows exactly what to do and where to get the information on chemicals that they may be exposed to at work. My name is Leslie Canham, and I hope you've enjoyed this program on the new Hazard Communication Standard.